We don't even know if he's a president. And, and just to clarify they here. They threw him out of a campaign like a dog. We don't even know. Is he our president? You did get a few moments, I felt, of Trump being Trump. And it was usually when referring to Joe Biden. Kamala Harris, very keen to point out a new Democratic Party trope. You're not fighting against Biden, you're fighting against me. And conducting the brinkmanship rather well of saying, like, of respecting peculiarly or honoring the odd, warped legacy of Biden, while continually presenting herself as a progression and an, as an advancement. But as Trump said in his closing remarks, Kamala Harris is in government right now. Sometimes, I don't know how you feel about this, let me know in the comments, you're so caught up in the constant pumping out of toxic ephemera that you can't even remain focused on. Hold on, you are in government. Is there going to be a war? What are we going to do about inflation? Are you concerned about the border or not? Is fracking good or is fracking not good? What's our position on all this? Whilst Trump's malapropisms and claims, for example, the immigration and cat moment are very vivid and clear, what you'll get from materialist liberalism is a general fog of deceit and deception and distraction that's harder to discern and therefore sort of less easy to condemn. Let's have a look at the vintage moments of Trump where he does what he does best, witty maxims that are designed to evoke a, a, a humorous response. It could lead to World War III. Don't kid yourself, David. We're playing with World War III, and we have a president that we don't even know if he's... Where is our president? We don't even know if he's a president. And, and just to clarify they here... They threw him out of a campaign like a dog. We don't even know. Is he our president? Right, so I, I guess a lot of you say in the chat that this is Trump bringing your attention to issues that do need to be addressed. We could be on the precipice of a war with Vladimir Putin. Nothing's being done to de-escalate that situation. It seems to me that there's an appetite to continue funding it. Isn't it really peculiar that between these two debates, the Trump-Biden debate and now the Trump-Kamala one, Joe Biden has sort of been put in this odd position where he's still president. Who's making decisions right now? Who's actually the president in this moment? What is the chain of command? Who is legislating? Who's regulating? Who is the commander in chief? So there are moments amidst it, uh, in spite of the restrictive conditions, where you're able to see, yeah, like that Trump, who famously doesn't prepare for these debates, is pointing out things that I suppose ought to be brought to the forefront. Let me know what you guys think. Here he is. So this is probably my favorite moment for the for the night, just because it's existentially a weird thing to say. Check this out. This is Trump being Trump. But we have a president, Mr. President that doesn't know he's alive. Your time is up. He doesn't know he's alive. Like, that's a really profound existential state. Like, I don't actually know whether or not I'm alive. No one could confirm that, really, because all information would be coming through the same milieu. You are alive. Yeah, but how do I know? I mean, you're just you. You're part of the problem. It's a sort of a really bizarre existential claim. Um, one of the moments that a lot of people enjoyed on X was the brief bait in and reference to Kamala's previous VP debate with Mike Pence. The um, I'm talking now moment. Let's revisit that. Different policies like... She was big on defund the police. In Minnesota, she went out. Wait a minute. I'm talking now. If you don't mind, please. Does that sound familiar? Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. Well, wait, wait. I'm speaking. The important. She went out. Yeah, that'll be a moment that will be memed and that people doubtlessly enjoy. Another moment that you would point to for Trump, I suppose, is the offering of the MAGA hat, a, a reference and allusion to Kamala taking on the new positions and surprising positions on fracking and indeed border security. Where, you know, if you do want to build a wall, you could build a wall right now. But don't we all recall that that very wall was the source of most of the condemnation and ire that 2016 Trump faced? And Trump, I'll let you respond. First of all, they bought their chips from Taiwan. We hardly make chips anymore because of uh, philosophies like they have and policies like they have. I don't say her because she has no policy. Everything that she believed three years ago and four years ago is out the window. She's going to my philosophy now. In fact, I was going to send her a MAGA hat. She's gone to my philosophy. But if she ever got elected, she'd change it. How are you guys feeling about 
uh, facial expressions. Let's uh, like think some of the not speaking moments from Kamala. I don't know. Is that more of the joy that we're experiencing there? I'm not sure about it. I I think neutrality is what you want. Neutrality and occasional bemusement. The excessive displays of emotion, uh, you know, I don't know. It's difficult, isn't it, not to fall into judging the debate on its own terms, which is the terms of a spectacle, a presentation of two figures that represent, on one hand, emotional states, whether that's a kind of a vehemence and anger and disdain for institution, for government, for globalism, a kind of despair and anger around, around issues like immigration, or this sort of emergent haughtiness and superciliousness that we're being taught to identify as joy, but seems to me to be the epitome of much of what's wrong with liberalism, liberalism alloyed with corporatism, a kind of sense of uh, condescension and personal certainty of um, um, moral piety and bio easy biographical grandeur, constant referencing to your own of your own past. When I was a child, I did this. I'm from this background. I created that. I'm not sure what the merits and values of that are. And I personally find it like I get a kind of uh, psychological bends moving between biography, generalities, trivialities, and then suddenly being confronted with policy about like we're going to give $25,000 to a big business and we're doing startup for, sorry, small businesses. We're going to do startup schemes. It seems like, like how are we supposed to understand simultaneously Global war, globalization, events in the Middle East, funding of Ukraine, botched Afghanistan. Do you want a small startup loan? Did Obamacare work? There's something ridiculous about the specificity of policy when indeed the specificity of policy should be all that matters. They oughtn't be ciphers for our unconscious emotion. And sometimes I feel that's the best that's being offered, along with, I suppose, a curated space that legacy media presents you with, which plainly means these debates have a function. And the reason the debates must take place at all is because both sides must see that there's a benefit in them. And it will be the end of our country. She's a Marxist. Everybody knows she's a Marxist. Her father's a Marxist professor in economics, and he taught her well. We'll continue with that in a matter of moments, but first, a quick word from our partners. The war against free speech is in full swing. We are the vanguard, bravely fighting back. Rumble's the home of this channel, Stay Free, and a leader in defending the fundamental human right of free speech. They've joined X to sue a cartel of advertisers and ad agencies who conspired to block ad revenue from going to the platforms. Recently, they've launched Rumble Premium. This, I think, is going to be a game changer for all of us. It's an ad-free viewing experience with great perks for viewers and creators. Rumble Premium will give you the ability to dive into your favorite content on your mobile or desktop or smart TV and savor every uninterrupted second of my content. Why don't you upgrade to Rumble Premium today? Support my free speech and the free speech of other content creators on this platform. Please go to Rumble now, rumble.com forward slash premium. And if you use the code brand, you'll save $10 and Rumble will be aware that our stream is creating great converts. So that's rumble.com forward slash premium. And do use the code brand to save $10. Anyway, there's a link there at the bottom of the screen now. We're posting it in the chat. Join up. Let's get back to the content. But when you look at what she's done to our country, and when you look at these millions and millions of people that are pouring into our country monthly, where it's, I believe, 21 million people, not the 15 that people say, and I think it's a lot higher than the 21, that's bigger than New York State pouring in. And just look at what they're doing to our country. They're criminals. Many of these people coming in are criminals. And that's bad for our economy, too. You know, you mentioned before, we'll talk about immigration later. Well, bad immigration is the worst thing that can happen to our economy. They have, and she has, destroyed our country with policy that's insane. Almost policy that you'd say they have to hate our country. President Trump, thank you. Lindsay. Here's one of the fact check moments, um, the, the repeated claim that Trump somehow endorsed the Charlottesville uh, protesters, the now famous good people on both sides moment, which I think has been significantly fact checked. Let's have a look at that. Let's remember Charlottesville. 
where there was a mob of people carrying tiki torches, spewing anti-Semitic hate. And what did the president then at the time say? There were fine people on each side. Okay, so there's that claim being reiterated. It was a different term, and it was a term that related to energy because they have destroyed our energy business. That was where bloodbath was. Also, on Charlottesville, that story has been, as you would say, debunked. Laura Ingram, Sean Hannity, Jesse, all of these people, they covered it. If they go an extra sentence, they will see it was perfect. It was debunked in almost every newspaper, but they still bring it up, just like they bring 2025 up. Amidst all the generalities, banalities, and triviality looms large the visceral fact that we could be on the precipice of a global war, and perhaps the function of the world's most powerful nation would be to intervene diplomatically to prevent that from happening. When we talked about during the debate when they talked about the Middle East or Ukraine, Russia. These were the moments where I felt everything coming into a kind of sharp focus. If indeed this war escalates, it will have a significant impact for everyone. Do you feel that the media and the Kamala campaign are focusing on issues that prevent us collectively recognising the severity of the situation that we are being guided elegantly, if unconsciously, towards, along with increasing authoritarianism? The threat of war is perhaps the biggest existential challenge that all of us face. Now, the subject of war begins, of course, with the the handling of the Afghanistan departure, which many people, and Trump in particular, regards as botched, the leaving behind of artillery and military equipment, the tragic deaths of American service personnel, and indeed was anything achieved by America during that entire intervention other than $14 trillion squandered, wasted, certainly spent 50% of which ended up in the hands of the military industrial complex, which leaves us all with a terrifying question. Perhaps government, partners, big business, in particular the military industrial complex, in sustaining, perpetuating and initiating wars for no reason other than it's good business. And if that is true, surely anything that disrupts that process would be a benefit. Let's have a look at Trump's moment on Afghanistan. See, I'm a different kind of a person. I fired most of those people. Not so graciously. They did bad things or a bad job. I fired them. They never fired one person. They didn't fire anybody having to do with Afghanistan and the Taliban and the 13 people who's, who's, were just killed, viciously and violently killed. And I got to know the parents and the family. They didn't fire. They should have fired all those generals, all those top people, because that was one of the most incompetently handled situations anybody has ever seen. So when somebody does a bad job, I fire them. And you take a guy like Esper. He was no good. I fired him. So he writes a book. Another one writes a book because with me, they can write books with nobody else. Can they? But. They have done such a poor job and they never fire anybody. Another f phenomena that we see over the course of the debate is the resistance to fact checking extraordinary claims that come from Kamala. The idea that Putin has an imperialist and colonizing agenda is an entirely a constructed one. There's nothing to suggest that Vladimir Putin wants to invade in the entirety of Ukraine, then ultimately Poland, and then, of course, the world. And in the way that Trump was subject to live fact-checking for uh, you know, almost, I would say, in response to um, many of his answers, it seems that the claim that Putin will invade Poland is egregious enough to warrant a little investigation. Here's that claim being made. Understand why the European allies and our NATO allies are so thankful that you are no longer president and that we understand the importance of the greatest military alliance the world has ever known, which is NATO, and what we have done to preserve the ability of Zelensky and the Ukrainians to fight for their independence. Otherwise, Putin would be sitting in Kyiv with his eyes on the rest of Europe, starting with Poland. And why don't you tell the 800,000 Polish Americans right here in Pennsylvania how quickly you would give up for the sake of favor and what you think is a friendship with what is known to be a dictator who would eat you for lunch. That, I reckon that the liberal media will point to that 
as a moment of victory. Do you imagine so? Let me know in the comments and the chat. But the claim that Putin has plans to invade Poland is a facetious and fictitious one. Here, I suppose, is a moment where we see Donald Trump making a declaration that's encouraging to most people the idea that ending war and stopping bloodshed generally, broadly, globally, quickly, is a desirable outcome. We'd solve this war in 24 hours. You said so just before the break tonight. How exactly would you do that? And I want to ask you a very simple question tonight. Do you want Ukraine to win this war? I want the war to stop. I want to save lives that are being uselessly, people being killed by the millions. It's the millions. It's so much worse than the numbers that you're getting, which are fake numbers. You know, they are idea that Trump is an acolyte of Putin's has been a mainstay of Democratic Party campaigning as far back as Hillary, including the erroneous and proven false claims that Russian interference benefited him in the 2016 election. It's an idea that has a kind of a tenacious allure to the Democrats that they simply cannot relinquish. And yet Putin himself last week said he would prefer a Kamala presidency. And here, Donald Trump reminds her of that. That these dictators and autocrats are rooting for you to be president again because they're so clear. They can manipulate you with flattery and favors. And that is why so many military leaders who you have worked with have told me you are a disgrace that is why we understand that we have to have a president who is not consistently weak and wrong on Vice national president security, Harris. including the importance of upholding and respecting in highest regard our military. Vice President Harris, thank you. They're the ones, and she's the one that caused it, that's weak on national security by allowing every nation last month for the year, 168 different countries sending people into our country. Their crime weights are way down. Putin endorsed her last week, said, I hope she wins. And I think he meant it. I wonder if anyone feels any better educated having watched that debate or whether it was, in a sense, a peculiar dance moving between generalizations, biography, trivia and extraordinary claims clearly guided by biased auditors who favour Kamala Harris. I suppose if you come into this as a Trump supporter, you leave it as a Trump supporter celebrating his bon mots and zingers. If you come into this craving a Kamala Harris presidency, you leave with the sense that she certainly did a better job than Joe Biden. But it's difficult for me not to leave this thinking, wow, what we're what witnessing again is a collaboration between various institutions of power, most obviously the current government and the media. And Donald Trump's claim that if Kamala Harris believed strongly in these things, she could undertake legislation to amend these ailing issues immediately right now. And yet that isn't happening. And surely that's something we can take home. The, the people that currently have their hands on the levers of power can't campaign as if they're peripheral outsiders hold up somewhere taking pot shots at tyrann tyrannical patriarchs when they themselves are literally in power but that's just what i think let me know what you think in the comments and the chat Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to see more uncensored content where free speech can flourish, join our live stream. Click the link right here to watch the next video if you want to or become a member of a growing movement. Download the Rumble app and you'll be informed every time we make a new piece of content. Stay free.